Hi guys, this is Lisa Athern, and I'm sorry to get this video to you a day late. Uh, the hurricane knocked out my power and my internet and my air conditioning for the past day. So, but uh, starting this morning, Saturday morning, I now have air conditioning and electricity and internet. So I'm gonna share with you a video lecture for what we would have covered on Friday, which is chapters four and five from the text. I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint with you to uh, help you grasp the information. If you have any questions about anything that I'm presenting today in this video, please feel free to contact me either via email or come and see me during my office hours. I'll also make sure that both of the PowerPoints that I'm going to be presenting to you in this video lecture will be up on our Canvas site. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get into a screen share with you. And um, show you, I'm going to go ahead and get into chapter four. So we'll start off on chapter four here. Chapter four covers giving your first speech. And you can break down this process into two steps. Every speech will have two basic steps, the preparation stage, and the delivery stage. So let's begin with uh, preparation. So the first thing we need to look at when we talk about preparing speech is we need to understand who our audience is. I'm going to be focusing on teaching you guys how to become what's known as an audience-centered speaker. And an audience-centered speaker is someone who adapts and customizes the content and the delivery of their speech to best meet the needs of his or her audience. So you need to understand who your audience is and what their needs and knowledge level and attitudes are with respect to your topic. And now let's turn to the topic. So you want to make sure that you focus your topic. You want to make sure that it's not too narrow, but not too broad. And part of, of figuring out how to narrow down your topic is understanding, um, again, your audience, you know, what kind of um, knowledge level and um, expertise your audience may or may not have regarding your topic, and also the time constraints that you have. For example, your demonstration speech it needs to be within four to six minutes. <clears throat> so that means you need to make sure that you can thoroughly cover whatever your topic is within that four to six minute range. You want to make sure that your topic is narrow enough so that you can adequately cover it within that time frame. <clears throat> the next thing that you're going to do in the preparation stage, and, and please realize that I'm going to be going over more of this in, in just a moment. When we get to chapter five, which talks about topic, purpose, and central idea. I'm going to talk about each one of these in, in detail. So this is just an overview, okay? The next thing that you're going to do in the preparation stage is develop your purpose and central idea. There are two purposes that you'll need to develop. The first is your general purpose, and the second is your specific purpose. And both of those help feed into your central idea. Your central idea is your core message. And again, I'll be covering these in more detail when we get to chapter five. Then you'll need to start uncovering some research. And it's good, you, you can start that research process, of course, when you are diving into what topics you should do. But uh, you need to start uh, getting into the research phase, finding sources that are reliable, that are uh, unbiased, and that uh, can be useful to proving your central idea. <clears throat> and again, we're going to go into more detail about uh, the research phase. Once you've gotten your research, your data, your information together, you'll need to organize that. And there are three main parts to your speech. You're going to have an introduction, a body, and then a conclusion. Most bodies are going to have between two and four individual body points. We'll talk more about that later on in the semester, but you'll after you get the, the information, the research together, you're going to start organizing that. Once you've organized it, you're going to outline it. This is a basic um, visual of what your outline, each outline that you're going to 
be handing in. Now, you'll need to hand in an outline for your demonstration speech, for your informative speech, and for your persuasive speech. And this is essentially what it'll look like. You'll have your title, uh, of course, your name, and uh, your general purpose, specific purpose, central idea, and then you'll have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. Your persuasive speech will look a little bit different from this because you're going to be using a, a different organizational pattern called uh, Monroe's Motivated Sequence. But this is exactly what your outline uh, format will look like for the demonstration speech and for your informative speech. You'll also note after the conclusion that there's a bibliography and visual aids, so you'll want to make sure that you include both of those. And again, we'll talk more about the requirements for your outline later on in the course. And finally, you'll create note cards. So one thing that the text uh, talks about, they talk about an outline as a uh, preparatory outline, and they talk about note cards as your delivery outline. So note cards will have a really um, skeletal version of your preparatory outline, and it can also include um, helpful delivery cues like pause, smile, and breathe. Next, you want to make sure that you practice, practice, practice. Um, practice is essential for a successful speech. You guys are going to be use, utilizing a delivery method called extemporaneous. And extemporaneous has a feeling of sort of a casual conversational feel. But in order for that to really play off and uh, be successful, you need to practice that uh, a lot. It looks very natural, but it's something that's definitely practiced. You want to make sure that during the preparation phase, you are practicing your speech at least 30 times, OK? Now let's move on to the second part of your speech, and that is the actual delivery. There are four methods of speaking. The first is memorized, and this is when you write out your speech word for word and then memorize your speech word for word, and then deliver it with absolutely no note cards or scripts or any kind of cues. The second is manuscript, and this is when you, again, write out your speech word for word, and then read off of a manuscript when you deliver it. The third is extemporaneous, and as I just said, this is the delivery method that you will be utilizing in our course for your demonstration speech, your informative speech, and your persuasive speech. In an extemporaneous speech, it looks very natural, but it's something that you have practiced over and over again. So in extemporaneous speech, you have the topics and what you're going to be covering uh, down pat. You're going to have that down, down and memorized. However, the exact words you use when you deliver it are off the cuff. And the fourth and final method of speaking is impromptu. And this is a spur of the moment type of speaking. I'm going to talk more about impromptu speaker speaking later on in the semester. So let's just talk a little more about extemporaneous, which is the method of speaking you're going to be utilizing for the next three speeches, your demonstration speech, your informative speech, and also your persuasive speech. As I've stated before, this requires a lot of practice. You need to practice at least three times for each one of those, uh, 30 times, sorry, for each one of your speeches. You want to make sure that you're practicing out loud so that you can find out what words are tripping you up. You also want to make sure that when you start a practice that you don't do over, okay? You're never going to be able to do over for any of your speeches in this class. You're never going to be able to have a do-over for speeches in the real world. So you want to uh, figure out how to keep going when mistakes happen. And, and notice that I said when mistakes happen. You're going to make mistakes. There's going to be both delivery errors, techno technological errors that are going to occur. And you want to be able to figure out how to handle those, both with your nerves and your nervousness, and also with just smoothing out that content when those errors occur. 
You want to make sure also that when you practice your speeches that you time them. Remember, you need to fit, your demo speech needs to be within four to six minutes. That's a two minute window that you have. That's a huge window of time for you to hit. So if you give your, if you give your demonstration speech and you're at seven minutes, I know for a fact that you have not adequately practiced this speech and timed that speech so that you are hitting that window. You want to also make sure that you practice with an audience, preferably with an audience that are going to be honest and helpful to you. The peer evals that are available for uh, all of the speeches up on our Canvas site, print a few of those out and ask your audience members, families, family and friends, to fill out one of those peer evaluation sheets and to do so in a really honest way so that you can get some good feedback about what's effective and what's ineffective with your content and delivery. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, creating a good start. The first, I'm sorry, with your delivery, the very first thing is your self-confidence. This is going to come primarily from getting good preparation, getting your content together, being well organized, and also from practicing. You would be amazed at how how much your nerves, you're going to have a better chance of controlling that nervous energy if you have practiced. So make sure that you are practicing um, that those 30 times. Second, you want to give yourself a good start. So when it's your turn to speak, don't say, oh, and you know, whisper to your friends, oh, I don't like this, I don't want to get up, you know, give us a good start, smile, be confident, walk up to the front of the classroom, make strong eye contact, and pause before beginning. Give us a chance to take you in, give you a chance to take the audience in. Again, eye contact is key in not only helping to transfer that nervous energy into positive energy, but in connecting with your audience. You should be aiming to look at your audience 95% of the time. You want to have a speaking rate that is not too fast, but not too slow. Remember, in an oral presentation, we can't pause, rewind, and listen to you again. We have to be able to understand what you're saying the first and only time that you say it. So make sure a lot of a lot of speakers have a, have a tendency to speed up their speaking rate when they get up and are nervous. So make sure that you're speaking at a rate that your audience can follow. Give us some expressions. Show us your enthusiasm for your topic and this opportunity to share your topic with your audience. Remember, you can pick any topic you want. You so want so if some enthusiasm, then your audience is going to take on those cues from you with respect to how they receive your topic. All right, clarity and volume. Make sure, as far as clarity goes, that you are pronouncing all of the words and correctly enunciating all of the words, in particular, the very last syllable of each word. Don't slur or blend that last syllable. Volume, you want to make sure that the people in the back can clearly hear you, okay? You also want to make sure that you're not talking at a volume that's so loud that the people in the front are just blown away. Give us some gestures and some movement. Use your hands to gesture, uh, particularly when you are emphasizing a point, and try and siphon off some of that nervous energy by moving around the room a little bit. This also helps to wake up a tired or listless audience. You want to make sure that you're not just stuck behind the podium or behind the computer. Make sure that your gestures and movements, however, aren't nervous gestures or movements. So a nervous gesture would be something like clicking a pen cap. A nervous movement would be what I call the caged tiger movement where you're just um, going side to side, side to side, side to side, like a, like a caged tiger. Posture and poise. You want to make sure that you stand up straight. Keep your weight evenly distributed on both feet, okay? Try not to kick out your legs or balance on one foot. 
make sure that you maintain your poise even when, and notice I'm saying when, you make mistakes or mess up. Note cards. You guys are going to be allowed one 3x5 or 4x6 note card, and you can use one side of that note card, okay? So make sure that you take time to fill out those note cards. Glance at the note cards. Don't look down and read from the note cards. And again, as I stated when I talked about giving us some um, expressions, make sure that you are showing enthusiasm for your topic. Transfer that nervous energy into enthusiasm for your topic. And make sure that you close strong. Don't go out in a, with a whimper, go out with a roar. Have some thought um, put into how you're gonna close your speech with your what's called a clincher, and we'll talk more about that later on in the semester. Be ready to take questions from the audience. Have prepared in your mind what are some basic questions that audience members could ask, and have a response prepared for those. All right, so chapter four, we talked about preparation and delivery. And if you have any questions regarding anything that I've just covered in this chapter, make sure that you email me or come see me during my office hours, okay? Now what I wanna do is I wanna switch over to chapter five. Now chapter five talks about selecting a topic, a purpose, and a central idea. So we're gonna talk about each one of those things. There's two different kinds of purposes we're gonna talk about, and that's a general purpose and a specific purpose. So first we're gonna talk about choosing a topic, Second, we're gonna talk about a general, picking a general purpose. Third, we're gonna talk about choosing a specific purpose. And the fourth thing we're gonna discuss is uh, creating your central idea. It's really imperative that you understand the distinction between all four of these different things before moving on in the course. So let's begin by talking about selecting a topic. You want to pick a topic that you care about. Remember how I just got done saying that you need to show enthusiasm for your topic. I'm allowing you to pick just about any topic you want for your speech. So make sure you're picking one that you care about. Make sure that you pick a topic that's doable, that you can research, and something that you can master within the time constraints of the course. So if we're looking at the very first uh, demonstration speech, make sure that you're not picking a demonstration topic that you just don't think you can do, master, or research within the time constraints of this course. Pick a topic that you think is gonna interest the audience, okay? Just because it's interesting to you doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be interesting to the audience. And make sure that your topic is narrow in focus. Remember, you're going to have a very limited amount of time in which to convey that topic. So you, make, you want to make sure that the topic is narrowed in focus so that you can adequately co cover that topic. So, for example, an informative speech on um, the geography of Italy probably is not going to be a, nar a narrow topic a, a topic that's narrowed down enough for you to cover adequately in say six minutes. But you could take a look at perhaps, you know, um, central Italy, um, at the geography of central Italy, and perhaps you could cover that within that particular focused, uh, that particular finite amount of time. Let's talk a little bit about how you can find topics. Sometimes I have students who have a really difficult time, even though they're given free reign to you know, do any topic that they want, they just don't know where they can go to get ideas about what topics they can do. So one thing you can do is take an inventory of your personal experiences. Explore your interests. What are some things that you are interested in knowing more about? And this could be just personal interests or professional interests. You could also engage in what's called brainstorming. And this is when you have a set amount of time, say 30 to 90 seconds, where you can write down any and all ideas that come to your mind on a sheet of paper and absolutely apply no critical thought uh, to that list. Just write down whatever comes to your mind and then start working through that list. 
You can also explore the internet for different types of ideas on topics that you could choose for demonstration speeches, persuasive speeches, and informative speeches. If you have access to the Connect sort, uh, site for the textbook, there are also some helpful topic finder uh, tools that you can explore through there. So once you've selected a topic, you're going to move on to the general purpose. Now the general purpose is always going to be given to you for each and every speech. And there are three main general purposes that your text actually covers two, but I'm going to talk about three. The first is to inform, where you serve as a teacher. The second is to persuade, where you serve as an advocate for a particular position. And the third is to entertain. So when you have a speech where you, where the general purpose is to inform, you may be giving your audience new information, or you could be presenting information that they know already, but you're adding a new twist on that information. You could be defining a concept for your audience. You could be explaining or describing something, or you could be demonstrating something, as is the case with your first speech. So your first speech, which is a demonstration speech, your general purpose is going to be to inform. And for this speech, you're going to be demonstrating a process. You need to show your audience how to do something. Your second speech, which is your informative speech, will also have a general purpose of to inform. And this is where you're going to present either new information or you could be defining a topic or a concept. You could be explaining, describing. Your informative speech may even have elements of demonstration in it. It's important to note that for speeches in which the general purpose is to inform, you are a teacher, not a preacher. You're not an advocate for a particular point of view. You're just giving facts, information, Unlike the persuasive speeches, if you have a, a general purpose of to persuade, you're going to be an advocate. You're trying to convince listeners to adopt your point of view. So you're changing their minds, and you could also be changing their behavior. Lastly, if your general purpose is to entertain, this could be something like uh, the best man speech at a wedding. These are typically speeches that are light in tone, they're fun, they're relaxing, but you want to make sure that a, a speech uh, that where the general purpose is to entertain, it's just not a series of jokes. It should be still well organized and thought out. Now let's move on to the specific purpose of your speech. The specific purpose of your speech is going to be a factual statement of exactly what you're going to do in your speech. So it's a factual statement of what you're going to do in your speech. You're bringing your speech into sharp focus. And the specific purpose is created so that it helps you stay on target. This is uh, especially important during the research phase. Uh, many students, when they start researching, they gather so much information, and they become inundated and overwhelmed with the amount of information that they're getting. And so there, it can be very difficult figuring out what is relevant and what's not relevant. So if you go back to your specific purpose time and time again, it will help you understand whether or not the information you're gathering is relevant for your topic or not. So in order for you to create your spe specific purpose statement, you're going to need to follow these steps. These are important for you to follow, okay? The first step, every specific purpose statement is going to start with a two infinitive statement. It's going to be followed by a reference to your listeners. The third part, it has um, a state, it's limited to a statement of one idea, not two, not three, but one idea. It needs to also be very precise and not too technical. Most importantly, the specific purpose statement is a statement of fact. It is not an assertion. It is a statement of fact. So let's look at an example here. Let's say that I'm going to give a demonstration speech on tie-dyeing. So tie-dyeing is going to be my topic. Can you guess what my general purpose statement is going to be? 
Well, if you guessed to inform, you are correct. All your demonstration speeches are going to have a general purpose of to inform. Now, if I'm going to create a specific purpose statement for my topic of tie-dyeing, it might be something like to show my audience how to make a tie-dyed t-shirt. To show my audience how to make a tie-dyed t-shirt. So let's take that specific purpose statement and see if it meets all of the requirements needed for a specific purpose statement. So does this specific purpose statement of to show my audience how to make a tie-dyed t-shirt follow all of the steps needed? Well, it starts with a to infinitive, followed by a reference to my listeners, or in this case, my audience, the same thing. It's limited to one idea, how to make a tie-dyed t-shirt. It's precise, it's not technical, and it is a statement of fact. It is not an assertion. So this specific purpose statement meets all of those requirements. As you are creating your specific purpose statements for all of your speeches, you need to make sure that your specific purpose statement meets all of these rules. Now, let's take a look at the difference between a statement of fact versus an assertion. What do I mean by an assertion? Well, let's take a look at the statement, I am wearing a shirt. I am wearing a shirt is a statement of fact. It is either true or it is false. It's something that we can verify. What about this statement? This is the most awesome t-shirt in the world. That is an assertion. It's something that I'd have to prove to you, and it's something that after I utter that statement, you could say, oh yeah, prove it. So I am wearing a shirt, statement of fact, this is the most awesome shirt in the world, an assertion. So it's important for you to clearly understand the distinction between a statement of fact and an assertion as we move on to the fourth and final component for your speech, which is your central idea. Your central idea is your core message. It's your thesis statement. It's expressed as one sentence, expressing one main idea. And your central idea, unlike the specific purpose statement, is an assertion. It is something you have to prove. All of the content in your speech revolves around supporting your central idea. We'll talk more about this when we get to the body of the speech, but it's an imperative for you to understand that your central idea will form the basis of the whole body of your speech because the body is used to prove the central idea. So let's take a look at all of the different components we've talked about today using the example of tie-dyeing as a potential topic for a demonstration speech. So the topic would be tie-dyeing. Our general purpose would be to inform. Our specific purpose would be to show my audience how to make a tie-dye t-shirt. And a potential central idea would be tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself. Now, do you see the difference there between the specific purpose and the central idea? Let's take a closer look at the central idea to see how it's different from the specific purpose statement. Tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself. Is this an acceptable central idea? Well, let's see. It's going to serve as our core message, our thesis. It's one sentence. It's one idea. And it's, a, it's an assertion. It's something that I have to prove. Going back here, if we take a look at this, the specific purpose statement to show my audience how to make a tie-dye t-shirt, if I said, oh yeah, prove it, that wouldn't make any sense whatsoever because all the uh, specific purposes is just a factual descriptive statement of what I'm going to do in my speech versus this central idea, tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself. After uttering that phrase, you could say, oh yeah, prove it. Prove to me that tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself. So again, you could say, oh yeah, prove it to that central idea and it would make sense. 
So let's play a game now. Let's see if you guys can recognize which is a topic, which is a general purpose, a specific purpose, and a central idea. Guess which one of these is a topic for a speech. Which one? A, B, or C? Well, if you guessed B, you are correct. This is a topic for a speech, honeybees. Now, let's move on to general purpose. Can you guess which one of these is a general purpose for a speech? To inform, to persuade, or tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself. Which of these is a general purpose? Well, if you said A and B, you are correct. To inform and to persuade are general purpose statements. Let's move on to specific purpose statements. Which of these is a specific purpose? Tie-dyeing A, tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself. B, to persuade, or C, to show my audience how to correctly cast a fishing line. Which one? If you said C, you are correct. This one has a to infinitive followed by a reference to your listeners and then a factual statement of what you are going to do in your speech. And finally, central idea. Can you guess which one of these is a central idea for a speech? B, voting rights, or C, tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself. Which one? Well, if you said C, you are correct. Remember, central ideas are assertions. They're things you're going to need to prove to your audience. They're things that after you utter them, your audience can say, oh yeah, prove it. So after uttering tie-dyeing is a fun way to express yourself, you could say, yeah, prove it to me, and that would make some sense. So today for chapter five, we took a look at your topic, general purpose, specific purpose, and your central idea. If you still have questions, make sure that you're reading the text. Uh, take some notes and contact me. You can contact me via email or see me during my office hours. And that is chapters four and five for you. Again, if you have questions regarding either of these, make sure that you're coming to see me during my office hours.